Greetings, comrades. Let's pretend you are in an ordinary Russian city, for example, Yekaterinburg, and you decide to ask people there who they dislike the most. Chances are high that they don't like the insidious Biden who imposes sanctions, oligarchs and corrupt officials, local governors, traffic cops, nosy neighbors, secret global government, Ukrainians, and they almost certainly don't like Moscow and its residents. And sometimes they even deny them the right to be counted as real, true Russians at all. Let's find out if the expression Moscow is not Russia is true. Why in many regions of Russia the attitude towards Moscovites is blatantly disdainful? Or maybe it's just envy? In fact, there have even been surveys on this topic. In 2019, people have been asked, how do you feel about our capital and its inhabitants, and why do you like or dislike them? It turns out Moscow is mostly disliked in large cities such as Yekaterinburg, St. Petersburg and Kazan. And the most popular reason was the fact that allegedly Moscow is draining all the resources from all other regions. 54% of respondents believe that Moscovites actually live at their expense. 24% believe that residents of the capital are too arrogant, 20% lazy, and 8% of respondents said that Moscovites themselves hate people from other regions. At the same time, 67% of survey participants expressed a desire to move to Moscow because the capital offers new opportunities. Let's find out how logical those arguments are and whether Russians have an objective reason to hate their capital. First of all, the expression Moscow is not Russia does exist, and many Moscovites agree with it. On the whole, it is not a compliment to Moscow, but a kind of accusation, because the implication is not that life in Moscow is so great, but that life in the rest of Russia is not good. And it is Moscow that is to blame for this fact. It is Moscow that is slowly killing the rest of Russia and prospering at the expense of the poverty of the regions. Let's get to the bottom of this. And now some boring financial information. There is a widespread belief that 80% of Russia's wealth is concentrated in Moscow. But 80% of what exactly? 80% of taxes, 80% of the turnover or 80% of all the money? Nobody knows for sure, but they repeat that number. 80%. Is it true that all the companies that suck the juices out of the vast expenses of Russia are registered and pay taxes exclusively in Moscow? Yes and no. The head offices of Rosneft or Lukoil are indeed located in Moscow, even though their fields are scattered all over Siberia and the Urals. As a result, Moscow is Russia's largest region in terms of economic size and budget. Its GDP is roughly equal to that of Sweden. And among cities, it is behind only New York and Tokyo in terms of GDP at PPP. So it turns out that Moscow really takes 80% of the country's revenues, and mostly oil and gas revenues, which should go to the budgets of Siberian cities. No. Most of the taxes that go to the Moscow budget are paid by retailers and trade companies, banks and insurance companies, and professional organizations, design, scientific and management companies. Moreover, these companies often provide services not only to the population and businesses in Moscow, but also extend to many regions of Russia. Also, according to estimates by the mayor of Moscow, our capital consumes up to 70% of the goods and services produced in other regions of the country, and therefore pays for them. The share of oil and gas revenues in the overall budget of Moscow is minimal, since mineral extraction taxes and export duties go to the federal budget, where the corporate tax of oil and gas companies largely remains in the regions of production. This is how severance tax is arranged in Russian legislation. As a result, it turns out that Moscow does get money from oil and gas, but it is only about 1% of its regional budget. In addition, if we look at the federal budget, Moscow is traditionally at the top of the regions of the Russian Federation in terms of amount of tax that is transferred to the federal budget. Last year, it was surpassed only by the Hantemansi Autonomous District, which is one of the main oil and gas regions of the country. It is worth noting that in 2022, only 23 regions of the country out of 89, or how many do we have now? Ok, we take 2021. Only 26% of the regions had enough taxes collected to cover all their needs. 
Accordingly, 66 regions do not have enough funds of their own, and such regions receive subsidies from the state treasury. That is, partly from the money that Moscow and other rich regions transfer to the federal budget. So it turns out that it is not Russia that feeds Moscow, but Moscow that feeds Russia. Again, not exactly. A huge number of people and businesses are really concentrated in Moscow. The entire vertical of power is in Moscow. All the top managers of the largest companies and federal officials receive and spend their large salaries in Moscow. All of the taxes on these wages and their spending go into Moscow's budget, and that is what makes it so huge. So, on the one hand, Moscow really does not directly drain all the money from the other regions of Russia. No region is paying its money for Moscow to be decorated with new paving slabs every summer. But because of the enormous centralization of both the state administration and the business structures in Russia, all paths lead to Moscow anyway. Talented managers go to Moscow because it is only there that major and rapid promotion is possible. New companies are opening offices in Moscow because that is where the whole center of business life is. Old and large corporations also want to be close to the Kremlin, in all aspects, including the territorial ones, since this makes it easier to find out about new legislations being prepared for the country. Well, ordinary people simply go there for the highest salaries, which exists because the region concentrates almost all big businesses and has a widely developed service sector. Not to mention the fact that all the best universities in Russia are in Moscow. Do you want to work in journalism? Sorry, but we don't have a single serious nationwide newspaper or TV channel broadcasting from outside the capital. Do you want to become a scientist? Yes, technically we even have special cities, no Kagrads, but we will still allocate most of the funds to Moscow organizations. And we will be building a new super modern scientific complex not somewhere near Tomsk, but right next to Moscow, in Skolkovo. So, to some extent, Moscow is sucking not money out of Russia, but people. There is a certain dissonance in all this hate, because all the main symbols of Russia are located in Moscow. First and foremost, the Kremlin and the Red Square. The President, the Bolshoi Theater, the Tretiakov Gallery and the Cathedral of Christ the Savior are all in Moscow. Unlike, for example, the USA, where the main symbol, the Statue of Liberty, is not in the capital. That is, in this respect, Moscow is indeed Russia and contains the best of Russia. It is an image to which all of Russia should aspire. It is a modern European city, and all the other cities should be like that. But then again, you can't make a megalopolis out of Khabarovsk if all of Khabarovsk's money goes to Moscow, as the residents of Khabarovsk themselves believe. That's why the paradox arises that people want to move to Moscow, but also think that Moscow is robbing their hometown. And if all the smart, talented and promising people move to Moscow after university, then who will develop these lagging cities? In Russia, there is a perception that Moscow is the place, and some say the only place, where there is always work we can earn money, make a career. For provincial young people with ambitions, their cities feel usually just not the right place. All the good positions there are already occupied, and if you don't have connections, you won't get anywhere. In Moscow, of course, it will also be nice to have connections, but in Moscow it is more realistic to make a career through your own efforts, or to screw up, stay broke and return home in disgrace. And in general, there is some truth to this. But if some student from Perm were to express his thoughts on the internet somewhere that it would be nice to move to Moscow, that's where my life would start, then Moscovites would immediately jump on him and start asserting that Moscow is not some heaven on earth either. The ecology is bad, and life is too fast, and it takes two hours to drive to work, and that the salaries here are not that high, and in general they themselves would be happy to leave Moscow for the countryside. You know, Moscow isn't big enough to feed everyone, better stay in your Perm. As a result, this same person from Perm will think, yuck, what inhospitable and unpleasant guys these Moscovites are. And the dislike will be mutual, in Perm they will dislike those arrogant guys from Moscow, and in Moscow the newcomers from Perm. But in fact, the loudest voices saying there isn't enough space in Moscow for everyone are the same guys from Perm, who moved to the capital 5 to 10 years ago. And they don't need any new competitors for a place under the sun. And it was the same 50 and 60 years ago. 
Those who came to Moscow from countryside in the 50s looked down on those who came in the 60s and called them limita. Those who came in the 60s, 10 years later, called themselves native Moscovites and sneered at their slightly less successful comrades from the same village. The dramatic difference in living standards between Moscow and the rest of the country was a hallmark of Soviet life. Even Leningrad and the capitals of the Soviet republics could not compare with the country's main city in terms of access to goods, products and services of all kinds, from educational to medical. Moscow was the showcase of socialism, the center of attraction and the center of envy. This excessive centralization was one of the most important differences between the USSR and the rest of the world. In the US, the movie business was developed in Hollywood in California, the computer business in Seattle and Silicon Valley, and so on. The best medicine was not at all the domain of Washington or New York, America's most famous heart surgeon Michael DeBakey worked in Texas. There were no such intellectual clusters in the USSR. Even in the military-industrial complex, the vast majority of design bureaus and research institutes were concentrated in Moscow and the Moscow region. As a result, a situation in which Moscow was hated in the regions, but at the same time every weekend people from those regions went to Moscow by train to buy some scarce sausage, became the norm back in the USSR. And the abandonment of this legacy, it would seem, should have been one of the important tasks of the post-Soviet Russia. But as a result, the gap seems to have only widened. Moscow is flourishing while the rest of the country is in poverty. In anti-Moscow discourse, everything that Moscow and its authorities are proud of – new buildings, street extensions, road and overpass construction – becomes a pretext for accusing Moscow of parasitism and wastefulness. Why is there incessant pavement of asphalt and slabs in the capital, while in the provinces in many communities there is an appalling lack of roads and an abundance of crumbling housing which no one deals with? After all, this is unthinkable in Germany, for example, where a resident of Dortmund sees the same sidewalks and the same asphalt as a resident of Berlin. The problem of complex moral relations between the capital and the provinces has existed in many societies, but in our country it is exacerbated by the supercentralization of various resources, the first of which is power. The vast bulk of power is concentrated in Moscow and within the Garden Ring. There have been attempts to move some of the state institutions to the second capital, St. Petersburg, but they have not been successful. Therefore, a grudge against Moscow is also a grudge against those who run the country. The word Moscow in the speeches of local officials is often synonymous with authority, and it is the central, higher authority. When explaining themselves to their population, regional authorities often refer to the fact that Moscow did not allow this, Moscow did not give that. Accordingly, people in the regions constantly hear that all the bad things that have happened to them are Moscow's fault, and that local officials would like to do well, but Moscow won't let them. I've heard stories more than once about how, for example, a factory somewhere in Belgorod was doing fine, and then it was bought by the Moscovites and ruined by them. Or how the same Moscovites bought a huge section of the nature reserve, cut it down and built their gigantic cottages behind huge fences there. And it doesn't matter that it wasn't really a Moscovite who bought that factory, but some local entrepreneur. And the cottage behind the huge fence was built by the son of the local mayor, who had never lived in Moscow. Sometimes you get the feeling that for many people in the regions, Moscovites is some kind of abstract curse word, some semi-mythical creatures whose actions can explain all the bad things that happened to them. Like the nobility in Imperial Russia, privileged from head to toe by birthright. And Moscow is some fairy tale place that is feared but desired. Again, if we go back to the money, then on the GRP per capita in Russia in 2020, Moscow is only in sixth place, four times inferior to the Nets Autonomous District. That is, it is not only about the money. It is necessary not only to equalize salaries in Moscow and the regions, but also to show people that quality life is possible not only within the Moscow Ring Road, but also in Krasnodar, in Chelyabinsk and Vladivostok. That the best science is in Sochi, education in Tumen, and the center of cosmonautics in Samara. And now, as long as some people have everything and others have nothing, the hatred between Moscovites and non-Moscovites will grow. 
And yet, even the most ardent Moscow haters, when asked to outline a scenario for the worst future of Russia, always talk about the collapse of the country, the disintegration into appanage principalities, that is, the loss of the current system of cohesion provided by the presence of Moscow as super center. Without Moscow, it turns out there can be no Russia. This is why you can dislike Moscow and Moscovites, but in the end it is worth admitting that in the minds of Russians, Moscow is Russia after all. And it would be good to try to elevate other cities instead of criticizing and demonizing Moscow. Thanks for watching. As usual, stick to the one, Steven, Yelizaveta Zakharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Beza, and Giovanni Zayas. You are my biggest supporters. Thank you.